Welcome back to Free Media. I'm Robbie Suave. And I'm Amber Duke. The ladies of The View are ready to defend Kamala Harris against sexist, racist, and misogynistic attacks that they swear are going to start pouring in any day now. Let's watch. She is part of why we got so much done in the last four years, and she has the agenda for the next four years. It's already started to be unveiled by President Biden. That's her agenda as well. She's going to put her own stamp on it. But what she needs is our faith in her and our willingness to fight back for her as we hear all of what we know are going to be a lot of misogynistic, mm -hmm. you know, sexist, racist attacks on her. We got to be ready. So are you all ready? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you can uh, hear in her voice, Representative Jayapal, her, um, there's no other way to say it, her, her longing for those attacks to start <laughs> because they know that will be, I think, beneficial for this narrative they want to construct that all criticism of Kamala Harris is necessarily racist, sexist, misogynistic, et cetera, when, um, I, and I'm sure there will be and has been and will continue to be commentary and criticism of her for those reasons. There's also plenty of criticism directed at her that is just based on her objective record as a part of a Biden administration that has, I would argue, failed the American people on the economy, on uh, so many other issues, uh, Trump was trusted more than Biden at this point by, by viewers and polls on virtually every issue uh, because of the failures of the administration. And she has been a part of that. So they will try to delegitimize criticism as, as being based on those things. Yeah, I think actually the only thing Kamala can really do to potentially push herself above Biden in a matchup against Trump is actually just to completely throw him under the bus, mm. uh, to completely differenti differentiate yourself from the administration, play into some of the reports that talked about tension between Kamala and Biden and say, yeah, hey, he wouldn't let me implement what I thought was best for the American people. He sidelined me, Jill didn't like me. And so all of these failures that have come out of the Biden administration are squarely on his shoulders. He's losing his mind, whatever. Maybe she doesn't have to lay it on that thick. <laughs> but otherwise, she completely owns everything that he's done that the American people have rated incredibly poorly from the economy to the border to- uh, Which she was foreign, in charge of. To which, yeah, the borders are. Um, foreign policy, um, even on the matter of democracy, Trump is rated higher than Biden. There's still uh, inflation above where it was when Biden took office. Um, crime is, is another issue that is top of mind for voters that Trump is leading Biden on and probably now leading Kamala on by double digits. So for Pramila Jayapal to come out and say, well, she's gonna continue the policies that Biden yeah, that's has started. Not, that's the opposite of actually how you should be running this campaign. Anyone. No, right. She wants to, like Obama, run as an agent of change. Um, but she's tied to the administration. It's one reason I don't think she'll pick, for instance, um, uh, Buttigieg to be her running mate. She's going to pick someone who is outside the administration. She's going to pick, um, I mean, I think she would be smart to pick either like Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, um, or Mark Kelly in Arizona, um, one of the other you know moderate governors in the relevant places. She's going to want someone outside the administration to to inspire any hope among voters. Yeah, to that point, what I thought was notable about the supposed vetting list that she had for her vice presidential running mates was that Andy Bashir was absent from that list of who got the vetting yeah. materials. And he is, of course, governor of Kentucky in his second term, um, who went after uh, Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, for being like a fake East Kentuckian, apparently. Um, but what they, I imagine, quickly realize is that he doesn't quite fit the appeal to rural working class voters bill because he is a Nepo baby who inherited his political career Bashir from is. his father. Yes, Bashir is. Um, they are one of the most prominent, uh, well-connected political machine families in Kentucky. So J.D. Vance is gonna out working class man him every single time on that issue. So I don't think it's a coincidence. He was also he just was a little, I saw list. an interview with him. And he was a little stiff. He was stiffer on camera, I mm -hmm. think, than, uh, than people expected. Um, you know, the VP selection doesn't, I don't think it matters all that much. Ultimately, it's, you know, it's Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump. Um, and she's going to be, yeah, she's going to have to try to differentiate herself somehow from this administration 
she's been a part of, um, you know, intro exp I, she has an opportunity, right, to explain what she actually thinks on some issues we've not heard from her on. Like, I'm genuinely curious what her foreign policy is if it departs from Biden. It's conceivable that it does. The, the, the Democratic Party from, you know, from liberals to left, as we've learned from, uh, from our time hosting Rising with people on the left, there's tremendous disagreement and dissatisfaction with Biden on how various foreign policies have been handled. Um, I, I know I'm hearing for, like from some people on the left that expect her to be, I guess, a little more to the left than Biden on foreign policy. I have no idea why they think that. And for all I know, she could be actually like less progressive on Israel or whatever they're very mad about right now. Um, it's a total mystery, and we have to wait to hear from her on it. But I, I bet when she I bet when she starts talking about it, she's going to infuriate the people to the left on her side. Oh, That's my prediction. Yeah, exactly. And I also think that Biden did not do her any favors by announcing that he was intentionally going to choose a black woman to be his running mate because right. it gives the impression, of course, that he did not choose the best candidate for the job. He intentionally narrowed his scope of potential picks. There were like four choices basically, and maybe he picked the best out of those four, but could we truly say based on Kamala Harris's record of flip-flopping throughout her career and not having a very consequential run in the Senate that she would have been the most qualified person to run alongside Joe Biden? I mean, that's gonna plague her, I think, for this entire campaign. Yeah, uh, Jessica Burbank and I, uh, my co-host at Rising, had this debate today about her being you know, a DEI hire, and look, who is the most qualified person to be president is a more subjective, That's or in true. politics, it's a more subjective determination than admissions to universities or hiring. And there's a, where there's a test and what, you know, we people on the right and libertarians and actually like a lot of Democrats and moderate people too don't like about affirmative action is every, you take a test, there is an objective criteria and then you choose someone who didn't perform as well because of some identity-based characteristics. In politics, it's like, you know, so again, subjective, who's gonna do the best job. Also, you're trying to appeal to get people to vote for you. So maybe if the identity-based characteristics make you make it more likely people will vote for you, that's not an illegitimate reason to select that person. But what I'd say about Kamala Harris is that there was just not a lot of evidence that she was even super popular right. among the demographics she was, for identity-based reasons, representing, that she had this natural base of support of, of popularity among among people of color Well, because women. Biden performed better than her among black right. voters during the primary. Black voters love Biden. <laughs> right, so it wasn't clear what exactly she added to the ticket. And I think even if that is one of your considerations, when choosing a running mate is, you know, where they're from or what their identity group characteristics are, you probably shouldn't say it out loud and, uh, and, and just open up that line of criticism for people to just point yeah. at your words and say, no, like you literally picked her because she's a black woman. Yeah. Now, to be fair to both Biden and Bernie Sanders, uh, who in the last debate they were in together when they were running in 2020, um, like they didn't, they didn't volunteer that information of free will. They were forced to make that statement by the media, right? They were said, will you pick a black woman? Will you pick a, you know, they, they're like, okay, yes, don't hurt me. Like that was their, <laughs> that was their response, right? I, I think Bernie only said he would pick a woman. I don't think he further specified, but they were put in that position by, by a media class that wants to, I think, highlight identity-based issues in a way that was, ended up being inconvenient for the candidates. Yeah, and that's a, uh evidence, I think, of a rather weak disposition that they would just be like, yes, sure. of course, please. Don't hurt me anymore. Yeah. All right, thanks for watching Free Media. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next week.